And let's move on. And Dr. Cole, uh, next topic, I want to talk about uh, some of the challenges uh, transitioning um, with this pandemic now where we don't overburden the health care system. Uh, what kind of strategies could you see in place to get people back to work and play? Yeah, Steve, it's uh, and, and uh, I think that the thing to be talking about now is uh, we are set with this sort of new way of life and focusing on um, the incidence and prevalence of the disease and uh, how the healthcare system is managing it and how we're managing it at a local level. And um, now, obviously, as you're alluding to, we're turning to the next phase. And I like people to think about this not as life after COVID, but life with COVID. And what strategies are we going to undertake to get people back to work? And the other looming question is, how are we going to get back to play to our activities? Competitive sports where uh, it's not a, it becomes a team sport, and then me, maybe even contemplating when we can have fans be at the same place in the same time. And this is not specific to any single sport. It's specific to every sport, and it is an interesting, fascinating topic that um, you know we could we could talk about for hours. But uh, something I'm I'm hopeful we can address. We've got a great guest on the line, Dr. Matthew Dawson, the CEO, co-founder of Wild Health, a genomics-based precision medicine company. Um, and during the pandemic, Dr. Dawson and his team are consulting with multiple companies and professional leagues on how to safely return to work and play. Thank you, Dr. Dawson, for joining us here on Sports Medicine Weekly. First question, what is genomics-based precision medicine? Sure. Thanks for having me. So genomics-based precision medicine is what our focus was before the pandemic. So what that means, just very briefly, is uh, every patient treating them like the individual they are. So instead of basing their treatment on statistics and epidemiology, Dr. Cole knows uh, that when we have a study that comes out of medicine saying something quote unquote works, what that really means is it works for 60% or 85% of the people. But what if you do the other 15% or 40? So what we do with our patients is we sequence their DNA, look at all the individual SNPs that give them advantages and disadvantages, and then look at their lab testing and have a long conversation and treat them based on their unique DNA and their unique lifestyle uh, for what works for them. So it's been a lot of fun doing that. We've had a lot of great success. And then COVID happened and the world has changed. Let me, let me ask you a question. You know, in, in the pre-COVID world, when you were using genetics as a foundation for decision making, when people ask you and they say, look, I understand I have this gene or another gene, how, how predictable have you found it to, to then say that because you have this gene, you will or you might actually exhibit this particular trait or what we call phenotype? In other words, when genes translate into something that's uh, 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 an anatomic or predisposition or how we metabolize things and things like that. Because there is a disconnect between having a gene and then how the genes actually act and function. And I'm curious how you address that. Yeah, that's a great question. So knowing that human operating system, the DNA is important, but honestly, it's only about 20% of the picture. We, Even though we're a genomics company, we like to tell people that your DNA by itself is pretty much worthless. So the epigenetics, how you express those genes is much more important. That accounts for about 80% of the phenotype. Uh, so you, everything you do in your life, everything, all your, your work, what you eat, your exercise, your stress levels, turn on and off good and bad genes constantly. So that's why we have to take those, those genetics and the DNA in the context of the person's lifestyle, their life, their goals, and then their lab work to see how they're doing right now. So it's a piece of the puzzle. It's an important piece of the puzzle, but lifestyle and epigenetics are much more important. It all has to be taken in a holistic view, and one piece by itself is good to know, but not powerful enough. You get a much better picture by looking at all of it at once, microbiome, genetics, lifestyle, biometrics, blood testing, all of it needs to be taken into consideration. Visiting with Dr. Matthew Dawson, CEO, co-founder of Wild Health, a genomics-based precision medicine company. I'm Steve Cashel with Dr. Brian Cole at his Sports Medicine Weekly on this Saturday morning on 670 The Score. Dr. Dawson, um, what are you doing differently at Wild Health now during this pandemic? Well, we're a big group. We think medicine is best uh, practiced as a team. So we have about 40 MDs and PhDs we, we work with. And when this hit, we realized we were very well positioned just to help. We have 
uh, neurologists, neurosurgeons, emergency medicine doctors, uh, event medicine specialists, uh, PhDs in infectious disease. And so because we had such a diverse group, we immediately turned that group's focus to helping with COVID. And we, we also have our own biotech lab. So um, we have a lab that has uh, equipment, and we were one of the first labs to be able to do the CDC-approved uh, reverse transcriptase PCR test. So we've been doing COVID testing for a while, the serology, the antibody tests, and also just the PCR tests and looking for, for the virus. So we've changed our focus. Uh, we have a podcast called the Wild Health Podcast. We do daily updates on all the news and science and translating it for people and then for our patients and for different companies and sporting organizations, we're helping them develop protocols to be able to safely return to work or just to do testing right now. We have a lot of patients on the coast and in hot spots who we've done testing for and, and gotten testing too when they couldn't normally. So our focus is we're still doing genomics-based medicine, but our focus really, we've kind of pointed the whole team towards helping solve, solve this problem and doing as much as we can to help. Dr. Dawson, let me ask you a question as far as strategies moving forward. If you had to sort of, if you had a crystal ball into the near term, what do you think the, the key factors are going to be to get us back to a, a sporting environment where, let's just say without fans, what are the sort of things that have to happen that are likely to get us there? And I know it often, discussion always includes testing and so forth, but I think the science and so forth would say you're gonna, we're going to need more than that. So what has to happen in our environment in terms of whether it's draw, short of a vaccine, do you think to get us back to play with some of the current things that we have available and what might be coming in the near term? Sure. So just yesterday, I talked with a group that wants to do a 12,000 person event in the fall, another group that has 9,000 employees they want to bring back to work, another group that wanted to do 300 tests a day for the next week, and then several groups that have 20 to 30 employees. So the solution is different for all of those groups um, to get back to play. I think we've got a few really nice roadmaps. The American uh, Enterprise Institute, they laid out their, their roadmap about a month ago. The White House has theirs. Governors are starting to come out with their roadmaps. So it's very different from place to place. Honestly, the only thing I think we can really talk about with any specificity is the testing part. Like you mentioned, there has to be more robust testing. Uh, and honestly, we think there are a couple really good solutions to be able to scale up testing. We, we do think that we can return to sport and work very soon if we have the right protocols in place and the right testing. Uh, just as an example, uh, here in Kentucky, uh, Churchill Down just got approval from the governor's office yesterday to return to racing on May 11th. But it is a large document of protocols they put together, and they have robust testing in there. So if you can solve those problems, I think we can go back to play. But testing really is the key right now because the prevalence is just too high for us to get any number of people back together without having testing that really gives us a level of comfort that we're not spreading this around. Let me ask you an additional question related to that. The sensitivity of these often what we call PCR testing, the testing that looks uh, to say if one does or does not have the virus is based upon um, if they're shedding the virus pot potentially uh, at the time of the test. I, 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 I would imagine that's part of it. But what is often talked about is that the test can be negative when three to five days later, someone could then exhibit symptoms and actually have the disease, assuming they didn't have an exposure between the time they had their test and the disease. What would your strategy be to um, retest if need be? a time for someone who's trying to get back where they might be exposed to other people when in, the, in fact the test was actually negative and maybe subsequent testing might be required to prove that they are truly negative. I hope that's not too confusing. No, that, that's a great question. So you really bring up two points. Number one is the sensitivity of the test, how many false negatives you get, and number two, the incubation period. If you're exposed but you're not going to test positive yet and you will later. So both of those can be addressed with serial testing. So what I mean by that is, say, for example, um, so the PCR test, technically that's the gold standard. The sensitivity is probably around 97 percent, but it's definitely probably over 95. Uh, of course, if you collect it poorly, we've seen reports of 25 percent false negative rates, which is really bad. It seems to be more like 75 percent. 
So the way you get around that is by serial testing. The more times you test somebody, the less likely that you're going to have a false negative. So, for example, if the prevalence is 2% and you want to test 100 people, two of those people are going to have are going to, are going to be positive on average. So the chance of missing one of those is 1 in 20 if your sensitivity is 95%. So if you test two of them, then the chance of missing one of those two is going to be about 1 in 10. That's not acceptable, kind of a 10% risk of having one person, let's say in a football game. So in an NFL football game, 90 people on average get on the field. So you're testing 100 of them, you get a 10% chance of having someone in that game. So if you play 10 games on Sunday, you're probably going to have a positive player out there. However, if you test them the day before in the morning, and then you test them all in the evening as well, then you've really cut that down from 1 in 10 to you take the 95% sensitivity again, and you're more like 1 in 200. So if you're able to layer three tests, one in the morning, one in the evening, and one the next morning before the game, you're getting down to around a 1 in a 1,000 chance. So then you're at a point where the risk of them having an accident on the way in the car or getting injured on the field is probably just as high or higher. So the layered testing solves a false positive. Now, if you want to get a group together for a week, then you're going to get a negative test because someone is in an incubation period, and they're going to test positive three or four days later, where you could simply test every day to try to catch that person. Uh, the obvious issue with this is, is the cost and being able to have that many tests which we think the two solutions to that, which no one are talking about, are the LAMP test and pooled testing as well, which, Dr. Coe, we haven't talked about pooled testing, but we think that is a real solution as well. I'm happy to explain more about those as well. I just don't want to get more in the weeds than your listeners want to hear about. Just clarify one thing. you know. Um, so if you have a positive, you mentioned if you have a false positive, um, but so it's really meant, sensitive. Did you mean false negative? I meant a false negative. If I said a false okay. positive, I meant false yeah. negative. Okay. Correct. So just to clarify, and it would seem to me that so when it, Steve, I'll just explain it to you because it gets confusing, but it's important. No one, no one wants a statistics course on in five minutes or less. But if the sensitivity is high, it means it's really sensitive to pick up that test. So that if you've got it, you're likely to pick it up with the test. But when you don't pick it up, when you really have the disease, that's called a false negative. In other words, the test was negative when you really have it. And what he's saying is that repeat testing over a short timeline is if someone really has it, it gives you the opportunity again to pick it up when it otherwise could miss it. But I was curious that is that just because more time has passed and the test can now pick it up? more reliably because a couple hours have passed or is there just an error because you could you and I could walk out have one virus in our nasal pharynx and that's just not enough but six hours later it's enough for the test to then pick it up I know it's a complicated question but it's often that's one of the things that's been on my mind about this repeat testing concept is it really that more time has passed or that the test just has an inherent error and because you have that one virus you really should have picked it up when it didn't do you know what I'm saying? I do, exactly. And so if we're testing that quickly, like the same day, then we're really talking more about not that time is passing, but just simply there is a error. Sometimes it's human collection. Sometimes it's a machine issue. And the other way to talk about these PCR tests and the coronavirus tests are the limit of detection. So, for example, the PCR, qPCR, has an LOD or limit of detection of 15 viral copies. So as long as there are 15 copies, it's going to be positive. And you pretty much always get 15 copies. Other tests like the Cepheid machine or the Abbott machine have higher limits of detection. So you need more viral particles. So it could just be that you have a really bad swab. Someone does a very poor job of this. And for some reason, you don't have those viral copies. So it's more of a human error issue or just a machine issue or a transport of viral lysis. There are several steps it could be a problem. The machine should be positive if you have over viral, 15 viral copies, but sometimes for whatever reason that doesn't happen. And by doing it twice, you decrease the likelihood that one of those mistakes happen. You want a Swiss cheese model where you're stacking these tests so that you, none of the holes 
all line up perfectly and you miss someone. Well, great stuff, Dr. Matthew Dawson, co-founder, CEO of Wild Health, a genomic space precision medicine company. Their website is wildhealth.com, social media at wildhealthmd. Wonderful information, Dr. Dawson. We wish you uh, continued success and uh, thanks so much for joining us here on Sports Medicine Weekly. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. me. If if anyone is interested in the lamp testing or the pooled testing, uh, we have podcasts we've released on that. It's a 30 minute to an hour explanation, but we really think that's the solution to large numbers of people uh, at one time. Let's hope we can get there. We're going to take a break here on Sports Medicine Weekly. When we return, Dr. Brian Cole our, and I are back with our Ask the Doctor segment. We've got some great questions from our listeners tell you how you can get involved. So stay with us at Sports Medicine Weekly, only on 